Good morning, everyone. I'm so proud that CUBE is once again in Miami, uh, my hometown, and for the next few days, your hometown as well. I promise you I'll be brief. I promise you, and like a lot of my colleagues across the country who say, as professional superintendents, they are not political, I will be political. And I promise you this, that anything I say can be verified against the data, the media in our community and beyond. But I promise you something fundamentally more important. And that promise is that I do not belong on this stage. I was inspired by the words of NSPA's president. I do not belong on this stage. And the reason is this. I don't belong on this stage because my father and my mother, neither one of them had more than a third grade education. My father was a custodian, my mother was a seamstress. Six kids were born, none of them graduated high school but me. We grew up in a one-room apartment with no running water or electricity. A curtain separated my parents from us, and then they decided to have a girl. So there were two curtains, <laughs> which means the boys were a little tighter. In the summer, it was hot and sticky. In the winter, it was cold. Miraculously, even though I was not the brightest of them, or the tallest, you may see, I graduated high school. My parents had no power or influence. They had no resources. And in my country, that meant you were not college bound. And fortunately, in this country, the most powerful on earth, sometimes that too is a sad, unacceptable reality. So folks, I don't belong here because I remember having to scrub decks on ships to earn enough money to come to this country. I remember arriving in Manhattan after flying to JFK with the money that I had earned and four hours later scrubbing pots and pans in the sweaty kitchens of New York. Yes, yeah, some folks today bemoan and decry and criticize and denigrate and insult people like me, people like the children in urban America, people like the children in suburban America, people like the children in rural America for no other reason other than the fact that they were born the way they are. They were born who they are, with the same God-given ability, talent, and opportunity that anybody, native-born or immigrant, should be given. Black, brown, gay, straight, makes no difference to me or you, for they're all children of the same God. So today, as I read the headlines across papers in our great land, I am shocked. So sometimes I'm driven into believing that I don't belong on this stage. And here's why. Most poor people across this country don't get to graduate on time, or if at all. Often, if you are poor and black and male, you go rapidly from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. Secondly, I had a disability. If you ask my wife and daughter, they still swear I have a disability. <laughs> I don't belong on this stage because far too often those with a disability who I think of as being specially abled don't get to. I didn't speak English when I got here, and yes, for those who may be listening, I was an undocumented kid, meaning I was an illegal alien. I do not belong on this stage. But if I don't belong on this stage, then the future of our country is compromised because generations before me, those who were often declared as not belonging on somebody's stage, still fought to get there. They fought to get on stage. They fought to get to the kitchen counter. They fought to be served. They fought to vote. They fought to count. And the day we start discounting some and overcounting others is the day we lost the promise of America. So I do not belong on this stage. But if I don't belong on this stage, then I belong amongst the people. And I'll tell you one thing. Democracy and public education are two sides of the same coin. One cannot survive without the other. So those who seek to erode the fabric, the tapestry of public education, 
seek to erode and compromise the promise of democracy. A democracy there is fulfilling. A democracy there is unapologetic. A democracy that is all enclosing. A democracy that is all accepting. Our democracy, not somebody else's democracy. Now, why am I saying this to you? Because I am tired of being tired of listening to people who promise change to public education in America, but they speak about it so much they actually believe they did some of it. <laughs> I am tired of the people who have never traveled the dangerous, lonely road of elevating somebody's dignity simply by kneeling down and seeing a child eye to eye, but promise to improve the world for us by changing the way we teach and the way we learn, even though they have never spent a minute in a classroom. I am tired of the hecklers that from the safety of the stands criticize what you and I do, even they have no clue about how to do it better. And I am tired of those who believe that somehow our nation can become great or greater other through investing, not spending, investing in children at the earliest possible age and providing a continuum of success throughout their careers. So for those of you who believe that these are just fiery words, I promise you not. You see, I've been superintendent here in this uh, school system for eight years. I count them in dog years. Because if you're a superintendent in a large urban school system, you last about two years and then you get canned. So I I'm living my fourth life. And there's a reason for that. And I know most of you are school board members. There is a reason for that. You don't get to keep a job in urban school systems across America unless your performance each year increases dramatically over the last one. And here's my promise to you and advice as school board members, fire the superintendents that do not produce in one or two years. Because those who have you believe that sustainable education reform takes 10 years to roll out, all they're doing is lying to you. They have no idea how to do it. 10 years. I mean, think about this. Every 26 seconds, a kid drops out of high school across America. 10 years, divide that into seconds and calculate how many you are willing to lose. And by the way, the vast majority of them look like you and look like me. How many? I'm not willing to lose a single one. That is why, if I go back to 2008, and there are those of you in this room that know the trajectory of Miami-Dade. In 2008, this system was a bankrupt system at three levels. We were academically bankrupted. Every single African-American majority high school in this community was rated F. Graduation rates as low as 36%. We were not number one in anything in the country. Nine schools, all historic and iconic schools in this community, under a threat of shutdown by the state of Florida for performance. 2008, if you recall, was the worst year, actually the first of a number of years that ushered in the worst economic recession, the Great Recession that has taken place in recent history, actually 74 years. But in addition to that, there were serious issues here. The system was bankrupt, ripe to be taken over by the state. A $6 billion budget with virtually no reserves. Healthcare costs escalating double digit percentage wise. And then the one level of bankruptcy that when I mention my board members get a little nervous, which is the ethical and moral bankruptcy. Because if your core function education is compromised and your finances are compromised, then you are unethical and immoral because for far too long you allowed the bridge to nowhere to continue to be built. And that cannot be accepted, not by me, not by you, by anybody. So we went to work. And I'm not going to bore you with all of the details, but look, leadership matters. And those of you who want to take back perhaps just some bit of information, I'll give you five bits of information. 
This is not revolution because everything we need to know about improving schools, about getting little Johnny, Maria, and Tyrone to read and compute is already known. This is no longer a skill set deficit. It is not that we don't know what to do. It's a will set proposition. Do we have the courage to do the right thing, to take on the sacred cows, to impose children as the tip of the spear in all of our decisions? And districts that do not perform don't do that. So number one, leadership, leadership matters. Principals are the captains of the education industry. They are in schools. Now I'm gonna whisper this because some people get really upset. I have fired, replaced over 80% of all principals in the fourth largest school system in America. And I don't apologize for it because when I became superintendent, many of them were somebody's cousin, somebody's friend. They did not believe in kids. I remember bringing in the nine principals of the nine schools that were in the threat of being shut down, and I asked each one of them. I said, brother, tell me, why don't you have AP classes in your high school? And one after the other told me, you know, we would love to because we believe all kids can learn. I said, okay, that's great. Let's, you know, next paragraph. <laughs> he said, I'd love to have AP classes, but I don't have kids for that. Anybody who tells you you don't have kids for that, you don't have a position for them. And I fired nine of them. I almost got fired myself because in 90 years we had not fired the principal. And I fired nine within the first two weeks. And here's what I know. Fire will be thrown at you, but once you get past that fire, you get a little singed. Your hair is smoking. Your skin is a little bruised, but you get calloused. And the next time you have to go through that, it doesn't hurt as much. 80% of the principals are different today than they were then. We recruited the very best across the country, instructional leaders who understand pedagogy, who understand the art and the science of teaching, of evaluating, of analyzing, of coaching, of mentoring. Secondly, not teacher quality. I don't even understand what teacher quality means. But I know teacher effectiveness. You can have all of the qualifications in the world, all of the titles in the world, and not be able to teach a child. You may be able to teach chemistry and physics, but not kids. And I don't need people who teach to the board, I need people who teach kids. So I look for teacher effectiveness. I look for people who were able to do it elsewhere, have great preparation, and can demonstrate it. Often before you get hired, you have to perform. There's an audition. Why not? I mean, do you really want to gamble on something that important? Hiring somebody for the next 30 years to impact thousands of a waiting audience without knowing how good they are? I don't. So teacher effectiveness is important. The third element, safety nets. Here's what I know, folks. Behind every single achievement gap across the country in any city and any district, there are preceding opportunity gaps. If our children can't read by third grade, it's because there are opportunity gaps before them from birth. Poverty, family disconnect, broken homes, violence in the streets, disability, immigration fears, all of that. Now, even adults, if they face one of them, we complain, we go to the doctor. We have millions of children across America who fall into not one, but all of the opportunity gaps, and we expect them to do just fine. So here's the solution. In Miami-Dade, we decided to address the opportunity gaps before kids get to us, creating safety nets around the poorest, most challenging, and challenged neighborhoods, where poverty and crime, where broken homes and broken zip codes are most prominent. You see, some people mistake equality with equity. And they believe that all kids ought to be funded at the same level. No, no, if you start here and I start here, and you give me the same treatment, we're always gonna be like this, the so-called achievement gap. The way to close it is you need to provide inequitable, inequitable investment, resource, treatment, aggressively to reach equality in terms of opportunity.
And by the way, public education, free public education, does not do a damn thing unless you create equity and you create access, unless you see yourself as an architect of hope and opportunity. If you miss those four ingredients, you get nothing and you get nowhere. So follow me. Leaders, teachers, safety nets. Safety nets means health clinics in every school. Safety nets means universal pre-kindergarten, high quality, all day long for every single child. Safety nets means city year in our schools as interventionists, as mentors. Safety net means delivering kids with the next important element, which is digital access. Look at you, some of you are like, you got your phones up in the air, and that's one phone, and then you have two iPads, and you have a laptop computer at home. I mean, how connected do you need to be, right? But we can't help it. We love the stuff. Our kids do too, and here's my proposition to you. In this hyper-connected society of today, the digitally disconnected is initially at a terrific educational disadvantage over time and economic disparity. And there are digital deserts across the country. And by the way, those digital deserts happen to be in the same zip codes where the poverty is high, where families aren't married, where kids have siblings who are in jail, where the crackling of gunfire is more prevalent than the chirping of birds in the morning. So in Miami-Dade, we lost our minds because as we saw those F schools in the African-American community going from F to D to C to A, graduation rates exceeding, actually increasing from 36% to 60, 70, 80, 90%. As we saw the graduation rate of this large, urban, very poor district exceeding the state average and then outperforming the wealthier districts as we saw the first inner city high schools in the state became, becoming A-rated, as we saw our NAEP scores first matching and then surpassing the state and the nation, as we saw our fourth and eighth graders becoming number one in reading in the country, as we saw our district win the Broad Prize, as we saw our district expand choice to over 500 magnet programs, as we saw our district getting to 64% of our children enrolled in non-traditional programs. Then we had enough to go to the people and say, will you invest in this rising stock? And in the middle of the recession, we put a bond referendum before the people. 72% of the people said yes, Republicans, Democrats, men, women, black, white, Hispanic, everybody voted for it. And we ushered in not only new schools, renovation, but a quarter, million, a quarter billion dollar investment in technology. Every school is Wi-Fi, every child is getting a computer, digital content, it is the reality. And for the poor kids, they take the devices home through us with Wi-Fi access. Because you build inequity if you force children to stop learning with the last bell, while others continue learning 24-7. And the last one, my friends, the last one. All of this is for naught if all we do is prepare our kids to graduate 12th grade. If there is no guarantee that that 12th grade is an enabler for post-secondary success or the world of work, you condemn them to a life of poverty. So we develop partnerships with higher ed and the private sector. Literally, we are building schools at zero impact to the taxpayers. Because we negotiate early on with developers. You want to develop here prior to us approving, make a commitment towards education. Companies relocate here, we identify the seven key industries that will require a highly skilled workforce. And we build magnet programs that begin in middle school. Trade and logistics, aviation, health services, financing, every one of those areas. STEM, robotics, engineering, international programs, we have it. Because for those of us who had concerns about school choice, charter schools, whatever it may be, guess what? That tsunami is come and gone. 
and some people thought, I'm going to complain every single day, you're dead. Some people thought that they would just duck under and survive, they drowned. Some thought that they could race ahead of it, they didn't. I live in Florida. We decided to ride the top of the wave. And if people like choice, my God, are we going to give them choice? 500 Magna programs. And our district became number one district in the country in terms of choice. Magnet Schools of America with more academies of distinction than any other school system. And then we said, if it's good for some, it ought to be good for everyone. Not just access to courses, the highest level courses. You see, I was a physics guy. I taught physics, calculus at college and high school level. And it hurt me when I came face to face with a reality that in some of these schools, there was no AP. So here's what we did. We mandated it. At no point shall any high school have fewer than five AP classes available. And the following year, eight AP classes. And the year after that, 10 AP offerings. And let me tell you what happened. Within three years, we increased AP participation by 400%. By the fourth year, Miami-Dade County Public Schools had the highest number of kids taking AP classes, and then the unnatural happened the year after. The highest number of kids in the country, even compared to larger districts, passing the College Board exam with a 3, 4, or 5. And let me tell you one thing. When you go back home, you ask your superintendents, Mr. Superintendent, you like your AP classes? He's going to say, of course. Then ask him, do all of our kids sit for the College Board exam? Or do you allow teachers to select out those kids that are not likely to get a 3, 4, or 5? You see, in Miami-Dade, every single kid who takes an AP class sits for the College Board exam. That is how you're measured. That is the measure of success. Now, folks, I know I'm boring you, so I'm going to land this baby very soon. <laughs> there are some who are promising these days that we need to become somebody we're not. There are folks who do what I do and beyond and believe that the solution for America is by having us become more like Finland or Hong Kong or Shanghai. Well, let me tell you this. Finland's too cold and eat a lot of salmon. <laughs> Shanghai is nice, but it's not a country, even though a lot of people in America speak of Shanghai as if somehow it was not part of China. And country to country comparison, China is still a place where if you are a female child who is born with a disability in the mountains, you're more likely to die than to go to school. So here's my proposition. Who in the world are we? Are we going to allow to our, ourselves to become a second-rate imitation of anybody else or force those who purport to lead us into reinventing us into a better version of us? Is that not what's happened generation after generation? Did we somehow have to import success or go somewhere else or we become someone else? We are the nation of innovation. And diversity is a new facet of innovation. One nation under all. One nation for all. With equity, with hope, with opportunity. I don't belong on this stage. But because my father never had a chance to be on this stage. And because I see myself in the eyes of beautiful, talented boys and girls who too sometimes don't believe that they can hop onto this stage of opportunity. It is my life, it is my drive, it is the way I honor my father by living the life I live in a life he should have lived had he had the opportunity. So maybe I don't belong on this stage, but it is my duty to build a better stage where everyone belongs. And to the extent, my friends, to the extent, my friends, that we do that, the greatness of America shall be seen, not through promises, not through words, 
not through shouts, through actions, through deeds that are rightful, they are right, and they are righteous. I'll leave you with this. I was a little bit late getting here today, and I could lie to you, but I'm not going to. SAT re reported today, this morning, early on, uh, the latest data for reading, for mathematics, and for writing. Just like NAEP, six months ago, the nation went down. Miami-Dade County Public Schools was one of very few systems across the country that actually went up. SAT at all levels, uh, critical reading, writing and mathematics, across the country, down, about three points or so. State of Florida, reading, mathematics, and writing, down by about five points. I put out a tweet, I was actually tweeting out as I was sitting there. I say, folks, buckle up, about to announce fantastic SAT performance for Miami-Dade. As the nation fell, as the state fell, and the nation and the state fell by about three to five points in each one of the categories, Miami-Dade went up 16 points in reading, 15 points in writing, 13 points in mathematics, one of the most diverse systems in America where poverty is close to 80% is now outperforming the nation and the state in reading with 79,000 English language learners. Let me close by saying this, from the impossible to the inevitable, there's nothing but belief, skill, and will. For those who believe that the, the trial, the tribulation, the threat is so great that we can do nothing about it, no. Anyone's impossible can become everyone's inevitable. If you have sufficient belief, if you have sufficient skill, and more importantly, if you have the will to do the right thing. And that is tough. But together, you and I, not on our behalf, but on behalf of Maria, of Jose, of Tyrone, and if you allow me, my third great educated custodian father, we must do it. Thank you very much and God bless you.